So um, I'm going to rename myself. I'm a replied anthropologist. And people say replied. Replied. <laughs> replied. It's very close to refried, I understand. But replied because when people say stupid things and mean things about kids, I want them to know I'm going to be at the door the next day. So that makes me very active on the one hand. Um, and I often bring some anthropology with me, so that, I guess that makes me applied. But mostly I'm involved in call, counter call sequences all the time. Um, so uh, I'm going to say um, very little, but there is one thing I want to tell you about that, uh, by way of setup. Um, Gene Lave and I, about 15 years ago, spent a bunch of time in a book called Theory and Practice. It's a wonderful history. Uh, by the guy who knows all the sources. And uh, it goes so from Aristotle to Marx. And um, the shocking thing for us immediately was, that of course, they're Greek terms, but they're not a, really a contrast pair. Theory is never supposed to have anything to do with practice. Theory is about first principles. If you thought first principles in your meditative work during the night, then <laughs> There was no connection to what you were going to be doing the next morning. That was interesting. And then uh, and after 12 years of Catholic schools, I was shocked to find out that um, Christians from St. Anselm to Milton, about 12, 1300 years, uh, insisted that there was no such thing as knowledge without charity. I, I didn't hear about it in my 12 years. <laughs> um, it's a very different way to, to think about uh, theory of practice. Um, and then, you, but nowhere where can I, in all that history, does I, can I find anyone who recommends that we put theory on a chair high above all others and then to take the knowledge from that theory and move it on down to hit the road. But in fact, that's, that's the setup that we walk into all the time if we're interested in education. And you know, I, I mean, I early learned get off, get off my case. I don't. I mean, hit the road. I mean, go down. How about going up? You know, from rising from the abstract to the concrete is always a good idea. Um, so this, this, I assume, if we, if all this goes really well, we'll have a bunch of hours together to see how we can imagine. And I think Gene's going to talk about this a bunch. That, how we can imagine next steps so that we can get out of the mire that we're in, because the one we're in, we're not getting out of with all our regular tools. We're going to have to think real hard and act real aggressively in order to um, create some world where theory and practice are not opposed in this silly kind of way. So that's it from the <laughs> replied anthropologist. <laughs> How would you like this to start? Um, do we have an well, this is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've never been given power like this before. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we just go in the order, like Leslie, then Chuck, then me, in the order we're sitting? All right. Um, <laughs> I, I feel as though I'm supposed to start by saying, Hi, my name is Leslie Sharp, and I'm not an applied anthropologist. Um, I'm. You know, I've been th I've been thinking a lot about this recently, but also it's something that's that's dogged me throughout my career. So, um, I thought I would just offer a few ways in which we can think through what the problem is with applied anthropology. Um, uh, to begin, I'm what's known. I I generally self-identify as a medical anthropologist, and that in itself is a domain that many people within anthropology assume must be applied. And so there is, I don't know if we call it a patina, a tarnish, I don't know that's associated with that. And I often have to say, I'm actually not an applied anthropologist, but I say that in an apologetic way rather than being uh, worried about the potential stigma that's attached to it. And um, it's because I, I mean, I have to admit, I'm pretty firmly lodged in the ivory tower of academia. And so I feel as though often I actually don't possess the proper skill set in order to be an applied anthropologist. But let's think a bit about what that means. Um, I've done a lot of work in another domain in science, in engineering. And in, in engineering, there's the same kind of stigma that's attached to applied engineering as opposed to what is called pure engineering or pure science. <coughs> 
And it's, it's very reminiscent of what happens within anthropology, except that the, um, the applied engineer can make gobs of money, whereas the applied anthropologist doesn't necessarily do that. The applied engineer is someone who takes theoretical ideas, moves it out into the marketplace, creates a spin-off company, and then may still you know, keep toehold in the academy or in a, you know, a private laboratory which is devoted to pure research, um, but is making money off of ideas. And it's very interesting to talk to people who are in these two camps as a way to reflect back on anthropology. The applied anthropologist, at least medical anthropology, has its origins in what we might call applied anthropology, in that um, the original medical anthropologists were physicians, they, or they were people who specialized in public health, who, uh, who recognized that there are particular social problems that could be solved through anthropological knowledge, grounded knowledge, field work, long-term experience within not only the discipline, but within a context, a social context, and push for social change. Uh, and then that slowly morphed into this idea that one could then be trained to be that kind of person and then seek out what often becomes consultancies uh, in order to be hired by people where you're the translator or you are a negotiator of some sort. And you have to be able to speak a different kind of language. You work on a different register when you're doing that kind of work. Nevertheless, the training that I received, I, so I went to Berkeley, which is a pretty radical kind of place, and especially when I started at Berkeley back in the 1980s and the dinosaur days, um, it, there was this shift that was going on within the field of anthropology, medical anthropology itself. We were fighting among ourselves over whether or not we were training medical, medical anthropologists who were ivory tower theorists, or whether we were training applied, and both were within the same program that, was, uh, that I was in. So that over time, I came to understand that there was once something called applied anthropology that eventually became what was more commonly referred to as, as practicing anthropology. And I like, you know, I like this a lot because one can then wrestle with the, the pairing of practice and praxis. And the, that pairing of practice and praxis then led to something which is really associated with the department where I come from, which is an activist anthropology. And that's personally where I find the, mo the most invigorating work that's going on. All right, so that's, that's kind of my, my first point is about the engineers and you know, drawing some kind of conclusion there. The second is this, it's like why, why do we still hold on to applied in some domains as opposed to maybe a more vigorous language that describes the possibilities of what we can do. And, um, and I'm actually more comfortable with the idea of the activist anthropologist. Doesn't mean necessarily you want your calling card to say that. Um, if you're working with, say, the governor of Wisconsin, right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not him. Right. Um, <laughs> Okay, and then my final point that I'll make, and then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pass to others here on the panel, is that I've always found it very strange that in anthropology, in all other areas of specialization, you might have a label that says where your area of expertise lies. So you might do legal, you might do environmental, you might do archaeology, you might do medical, as opposed to just being a plain old sociocultural anthropologist, I suppose. So you're proclaiming some kind of specialist, specialized domain that carries with it a, a, a toolkit which might be methodologically specialized and theoretically is absolutely specialized. So it's not just what one would do in sociocultural anthropology. Applied anthropology is a little different in that way, I think. And maybe that's something we could talk about. It's like, why is it that we if we still cling to the label of applied anthropology, although I would say we should get rid of it, um, why is it that we have to say, I, I, pr I practice out in the real world? What, why is that a necessity? Why can't I just be brought in as a medical anthropologist with a set of skills and knowledge that can sort of shake up what people are doing every once in a while, if I'm lucky enough for people to actually want to listen to me? So um, with that, I'll, I'll end it there and see what others have to say. My talk can be labeled Confessions of an Applied Anthropologist, <laughs> <laughs> because I am an applied anthropologist. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I had two main professors, Douglas Herring and Bill Mangan. Uh, 
They were bo both identified with two of the largest and best known applied anthropological projects in history. Uh, Herring was with Ruth Benedict in Washington at the War Department and the subcommittee that was planning the future of post-war Japan. And the issue, well, what they were laying out was that the American government knew nothing about Japan. Herring was born in Japan, had done field work in Japan, uh, was fluent in Japanese. Uh, they needed him. Uh, that was an unusual project because the federal government actually followed the advice that the anthropologists gave. <laughs> uh, this, in my experience over the last 50 years, doesn't always happen. Um, and the key point there was that they advised that, that Truman shouldn't let MacArthur put the emperor on trial and, and murder him um, because emperor is a, is, was a god and you don't go around killing gods. And it would be much more effective if you got the emperor to embrace the surrender and, and bring the people with him instead of leading to an ongoing uh, effort to re uh, <coughs> restore his honor. And, and that's what happened. Uh, MacArthur didn't get his chance to do what he wanted to do. And the post-war history of Japan is a very remarkable one, but it, it's uh, Benedict published this in her classic book, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which is one of the few ethnographic books b based on, written by a person who's never been in the place that was being talked about. <laughs> this other, a junior influence was Bill Mangan, who was a Cornell graduate and who was involved in the Vicos Project. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Vicos Project was a Cornell-sponsored effort where they essentially bought a village in uh, South America, Peru, and uh, started running it uh, to show what could be done if you, you know, had a decent strategy. And uh, so there's, there's a, an example of a heavily action-oriented anthropology. Uh, but um, at this time I was planning on becoming a clergyman, but uh, uh, the mental health research unit at Syracuse, where, where I was at the university, had an enormous grant to study all of the agencies in the communities that had sent people to mental hospitals or had been contacted by people before they wound up in the mental hospital. Uh, and they got the money, and one of the agents that was a primary gatekeeper for people who were disturbed uh, was clergymen. And being atheist from Saskatchewan, uh, the psychiatrist and sociologist planning the study had no idea who they would get on their staff who could possibly establish rapport with clergymen. And they had accidentally had lunch with my, dinner rather, with my mentor, Bill Mangan, who said, I think I have an idea for you. <laughs> and the next five years I was supported, six years really, one way or another, supported by the, by the Mental Health Research Unit of the New York State Department of Mental Hygiene. Um, so I, I, I was really uh, <coughs> doing applied research, uh, practical, <coughs> practical implications, um, and quite comfortable with it. And and I continued to, to which I basically made a decision after studying clergymen that I didn't want to be one, and uh, we took the other option and that has became an anthropologist. I, I look back at a 20-year-old whose only options that he had perceived was being a, a Unitarian minister or an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> it seems a very limited view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but what had them both together was a cultural pluralism and a, and a, and a cultural relativism. I went off to Harvard at, at which applied work was verboten. Uh, there was a medical anthropologist at Harvard. He was kept at the medical school 10 miles away, <laughs> and there was no contact between him, and the, any contact between him and myself between, would have been fatal from a, from, a, <laughs> from a relationship with John Whiting's point of view, who was my spent sponsor as I became a psychological anthropologist. Um, the, it's interesting to note in terms of how things change that uh, 40 years later, 
an MD, Arthur Kleinman, with an MA in anthropology, became the chairman of the anthropology department at Harvard. <laughs> that, that, if that isn't a, a, figure. a, a <laughs> shift that shook the foundations, I don't know what would be. <laughs> However, when I finished at Harvard and finished my dissertation on mental hospitals in New York State, I decided that it would be better to prevent problems than fix them, uh, because I was getting extremely depressed. <laughs> And so I chose to come to Teachers College because it seemed to me education would do that. That is, we'll, we'll, by improving education, we hopefully will prevent the population that I was seeing uh, under treatment in mental health domains. Um, and um, when I came here, uh, it turned out that there were, at uh, same time that I was hired, Bill Dalton was hired, and he, he worked in Libya and he had a specialization in, in Libya. But he was a social anthropologist, but he, his concern was the application of, applied a, a, of anthropology to community development and, and economic development. So he would be very comfortable in our program here in international education and development. And Lambros Komitas uh, was here and he had worked as a Peace Corps, Peace Corps trainer, but he had also was just coming off of a large project in Bolivia, which was looking at social medical uh, stuff. And so we decided that uh, since, uh, here comes the, the confession, <laughs> since none of us had ever worked in schools, <laughs> we decided that we would create a new program, Applied Anthropology, which would free us to do what we were doing, <laughs> and, and we could take care of the schooling as, as we learned about it. <laughs> um, and that proposal for applied anthropology uh, hit the streets, as it were, and you'll hear more about this later, uh, just after the uh, rebellion and campus takeovers of the spring of 1968. So that um, when uh, administrators or anthropologists were asked at that point, what are you doing that's relevant? You point it to the Applied Anthropology proposal, which was a joint program between Columbia, TSAS, and uh, Teachers College, and that answered the question. Uh, and the, from the Columbia side, of course, Conrad Arnsberg and Marvin Harris, that may surprise you, but Marvin Harris was the, the two faculty who were most formally affiliated with the program. Uh, Mark, Marvin kept his applied work rather secret, but I did run into him at a time when I was doing business consulting and he was doing business consulting. Uh, he was very embarrassed that that would come out. <laughs> I'm uh, embarrassed now. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, I became, uh, in my activist format, uh, I joined the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, wound up directing it later on in which we did a lot of programs in bilingual education. Um, and I had worked in a school in Harlem uh, for two years. Uh, and I was list literally listed on the organization chart of the school as the school anthropologist. Marriott, I really remember that. And um, so working to, to try to make things run better. Um, that's when I discovered that there was a wall uh, over the of education or, or the bureaucracy that, that kept almost anything from being uh, implemented that we have been talking about. Um, the principal and I used to have to meet in the janitor's office uh, to meet secretly if we wanted to talk to other people. Uh, the janitor's office, by the way, was thrice, three times the size of the principal's office. <laughs> And no one can run a school without the, the support of the, of the janitor. <laughs> um, so I learned about power and hidden power, uh, did a book on political socialization. Um, and then uh, in terms of the biggest project we did, we, I, I directed the, a project to create a bilingual multicultural curriculum for Head Start on a national basis. Uh, and um, the uh, and then I moved on to my last work, which was 
a study of people who transcend social expectations, and I became much more involved in, in that issue rather than, I always had a problem with Saul Kimball's, uh, not Saul Kimball, but uh, George Spindler's notion of culture and socialization as culture reproduction because it didn't give any uh, uh, opportunity for change. It was a static system. Um, and I came to follow Anthony Wallace with his talking about what you needed in order for an organization to function uh, was uh, a kind of division of labor uh, in which not everyone had to be the same, uh, but they had to be dependent on each other. Shades of Durkheim. Um, so rather than thinking of organizations that was having to reproduce uh, uniformly in all of their employees, uh, it was perfectly possible that you didn't need to spend all that time uh, trying to do that. And my consulting work with General Motors was, they were wedded to the model that common experience was necessary for anyone to do their job, and new hires were put through educational programs that were all the same, didn't matter what they were. And it really, um, as one plumber said to me, I became a plumber so I wouldn't touch electricity, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm, and electricians would say the same thing about plumbers. Uh, the, the white collar types who were trying to organize this didn't understand that these trades had their own belief systems and peculiarities. Um, I want to close with two general issues uh, which have always haunted us. Uh, when I was working for the New York State Departmental Hygiene, I was firmly convinced in my do-gooder days that I was working to make the system better for the patients. There's another perspective, uh, a political perspective, which says that I was helping the state monitor and restrict behaviors of, of its citizens. Uh, and you see that, and uh, that accusation has been often laid against Russia, but it's no less true of of our own. So that the, the ethical quandary there, it, and as Arensberg always said, was that ultimately ethical issues are individual issues and value system issues. And uh, this, so the fact that you're doing something with one goal uh, doesn't necessarily mean that people who have another goal are using your stuff for their goal. And that's uh, the old problem of you don't really control the information that you deliver. Um, Robert Oppenheimer learned that in, the, in World War II with the nuclear bomb, in which the creators of the bomb thought that they should control how it was being used. And that wasn't what the government had in mind. The other distinction I would make, which um, Leslie was alluding to, was in my words, uh, the difference between action research, in which you actually get in and get your hands dirty and go out and work with the people who are doing the job, uh, because was an example of that. Um, the, the work that I did in the school was an example of that. General Motors was an example of that. And, in, and then there's another category of policy relevant research, which, you know, we do the research and we put in our conclusion like in my Pathmakers book, the implications of these findings for educators and teachers. And uh, you assume that, that the world will come and read that and, and change itself. Uh, one of the reasons that I left, that, that became an anthropologist as opposed to my earlier goal, was that I thought that I could have more of an impact uh, doing research, which would have an impact on a wider audience than simply having one congregation. But those distinctions between uh, acting, practicing, and, and real research which has policy relevance is an important one. Um, the, uh, and I would close with a comment that Paul Bohannon made once, which was that it isn't just enough for us to publish the stuff and assume that people will know how important it is and what its relevance is, we have to get out there and demonstrate mm -hmm. that it, the implications of that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what Yumi was sort of based on. It was 
we had a research component, and the idea was that we would have a service component which would be informed by the research component, and anything we did on implementation was, should be based on a research base. Easier said than done. <laughs> well, um, I think, you know, I would end in the same, with the same sentence, right? <laughs> like, I always think that what we do has to be somehow um, public. It has to be somehow transformative. And I think, you know, we all get to it from different channels. But I think that's kind of why many of us came into the field. And my name's Ida Sasser, <laughs> and I teach at the City University, and I have my PhD from Columbia, but I started out in Chicago, so I knew <coughs> Hervé both at Chicago and then at Columbia. And so um, I think just to mention this, that when I was at the University of Chicago in the beginning, I start just because my biography actually sort of shows you the conflicts in the field. So I did my BA at, at Barnard, and Joan Vincent was my advisor, and I didn't know to think that anything was applied. I thought everything you wanted to do was fine. It was all about changing the world. And I was here in 68 as an undergraduate, so I was changing the world. And this program was basically set up, the one here at TC <laughs> is a product of those uh, demands uh, for relevance and activism and engagement and the words that we used to use. I think we used to say relevance, transformation. Anyway, the point is that and then I went to Chicago where I found, to my feeling, at that time, early 70s, was incredibly abstract. And you weren't allowed, or wasn't encouraged, you weren't inspired to, to do that kind of work. So I was in shock, because nobody had ever told me here, when I was at Columbia, that there was this other kind of world where these things were like not to be done. <laughs> and that you were supposed to be up there thinking theoretically in the theory, as, as uh, Ray said, never put his feet on the ground. I didn't know that that was anthropology. Nobody gave me that reading. So that was how ignorant I was. So then I came well, back they to were. Columbia. Hmm? How ignorant they were. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> both ways. <laughs> were, although Marvin Harris would get up at the AAA and argue with, you know, I don't remember, David Schneider. They might have known who each other was, but when they trained their students, there was no overlap. You know, <laughs> when you were at Chicago, don't you start talking about the nitty gritty. Ah. And when you're here at Columbia, don't you go off in the airy fairy, you know, nonsense. Let's hear what's happening on the ground. That's how it was in those days. And only the big men got up and had these sword fights. Or sometimes, like it was Judy Shapiro. It was you know, swords. <laughs> yeah, wow. wasn't it? I mean, isn't that no. what Murphy and Marvin used to? Murphy? She speaks symbolically. Yeah, yeah. And they thought of it that way. <laughs> and and they, anyway, so that's how it was. So I decided I was more comfortable back here, and I re reapplied back to Columbia, and I did my PhD here. And Joan Vincent became my graduate advisor. And actually, being just kind of young and. I was focused on changing the world. I wasn't really focused on what anthropology was. But anthropology seemed to offer me a channel. And I found that I didn't even really make a difference between. In those days, you, you, all three departments, Barnard, Columbia over there, and TC over here, were all together in the, the, the running of the main graduate doctoral program. It wasn't divided. They were all voting together. They meet, met. They fought. But they fought across, you know. So on my committee was Joan Vincent and George Bond, who was here, and other people. But I mean, though, but like the point was, it was also, I had somebody from uh, social work, was uh, Richard Cloward, who was very famous for social. He was the one that, with Francis Fox Piven, organized the mobilization for youth in Washington. So anyway, it was like I was only wanting to change the world and very young and thinking it was possible. And I didn't think that TC was any different than the... We didn't grow up in that program, in that doctoral program with Marvin Harris and, and all those people. We were not taught that there was this second program that was applied and it wasn't to be thought... We, we weren't even... We were just all together and all the students were all together. And I wasn't even sure who was which, I can tell you now. But at the time, as students... We didn't operate the way it is today when there are little silos. There's, you know, it wasn't like that. So there wasn't that feeling. 
And I did my field work. The reason I could say that when I came out and had my book, I was siloed, very much siloed. And my, nobody ever told me this, so I didn't listen. No, nobody really told me and didn't want to stop me. They were very uh, letting you do what you wanted. And my first book was a study of New York City, and it's called Norman Street. And it was about um, the working class response to the fiscal crisis, and it talks about the politics of the fiscal crisis, and it talks about the race relations in New York City, and it talks about the gender relations and the protest movements of the 19, late 1970s against the austerity, as we would call it today. And that is the beginning of neoliberalism. So it was like looking at a crisis. I picked a crisis because I had happened to be trained by Joan, who made me read Schism and Continuity. You know, Victor Turner, you've got to look at crises. They show you polarization. And the fiscal crisis was there. I never thought of myself as anything but a social anthropologist. However, when I came out, it was seen as applied. I also believed in uh, that you should, and I was trained to believe this, I didn't invent it after the 60s, that you should be engaged. That wasn't the word we used. But like I went with the women on their demonstrations. I went to the welfare office and argued with the other welfare workers. I also interviewed the people they were demonstrating against. <laughs> and I also went into City Hall and interviewed people there. But I also went to City Hall and sat in in City Hall. So that attitude of being engaged was part of what I was trained, and Joan Vincent told me it came out of the Manchester School. Mm -hmm. It also came mm -hmm. out of the action anthropology of Jean and Jay Schensel. It was used by Roger Sanjek, who was a Columbia PhD. There was a book you know, of that kind of work, and it was seen as part of mainstream anthropology that when you were acting in this engaged way, you were a theoretical person that was thinking about how you were, how these different efforts to transform society, how they would or wouldn't hit themselves against brick walls or change things. And this was theoretical. And I regarded my book, Norman Street, as theoretical. It was an argument about the uh, exploitation of industry and the changes in working class power as labor left New York City and as people had, I'm still making these arguments, people had to focus on the right to the city and urban social movements and social reproduction that were women and it was led by women and they were fighting for playgrounds and health care and housing. But it wasn't that they weren't working class or that they weren't fighting to transform society. It was that the labor unions had lost power and this was where the new priority was. I gave a talk like that at NYU about 20 years ago and they all dismissed it as applied anthropology because uh, that anything that was about the US was seen as applied anthropology. And anything from the 1930s, like even what Benedict, Ruth Benedict and uh, Jean Weltfish did a book on race in the US that was just seen as applied anthropology. And none of that was ever taught in the canon. So everything that you did, if you just looked at the US, funnily enough, I wasn't like a, I didn't feel embarrassed. I certainly wasn't a US citizen. I guess, but I had absolutely no compunctions about telling Americans what they ought to do. Finally, <laughs> finally, I did become a citizen after the time I realized I wasn't going anywhere else, and you might as well. I never learned, I never had voted because I came here before I was 21, you know, and you don't vote. And so I had to somehow become a U.S. citizen. But it never seemed to be, I never thought of myself as not entitled to have opinions. I, that was how it was. So then, um, but I think Joan Vincent supported me. She was part of the faculty and she very much was really a part of this program in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. um, people could say how or not. And, but as, as, as you said, as Chuck said, Marvin Harris, w I, he wasn't on my committee, but <coughs> there was a feeling that you could do these things and it was central anthropology. Now we would call it critical, engaged, whatever. The other thing I then did, which also to me was always central to anthropology, uh, was working in HIV, starting in New York City and then going to Puerto Rico and then going to uh, South Africa, where I was born. And the interesting thing about looking at HIV, I, I wrote a book about the politics of AIDS. It's really a book about South African politics and the denial decade, as you might call it, and what happened that led the president of South Africa to choose denialism and, or, and neoliberal cutbacks as his approach, which was, and what the social movements were from the ground and the African women particularly making decisions about sex and all that. 
from that from that position all the way up to looking at the global movements uh, to get treatment for AIDS and how they interact from the global to the local. And I wrote about engaged intellectuals or organic intellectuals as the linchpin between the people at the global level and the men and women at the grassroots level and how that kind of interaction led both to the educating the grassroots, who then educated the nurses in the <coughs> clinics, who then demanded AIDS treatment, uh, because the public health system in South Africa wasn't even, a, they were silenced. They weren't even allowed to talk about treatment or what was available. And that whole social movement, which brought Medicine Sans Frontier to South Africa to show that drugs worked. So they had these little settings where people who were told by the government that drugs were toxic could see that Western drugs were toxic, could see that when some people went to get those drugs, they went from being carried in the door to three weeks later walking out the door and, and, and going to the gym. You know, huge transformation. And that was part of the social movement. So all I would say is today we talk about public anthropology. I have a, an op-ed coming out today in, what is it called? Al Jazeera America Online, I don't know if it's today. But it's about the treatment and that whole process and the battle for AIDS. And I think all of us believe that we should be, well, I won't speak for you, but Chuck said it, and I think Leslie probably does, right? that we should be talking to people. We can't just leave it at the front door of our university, mm -hmm. that we are as responsible as scientists or engineers or anyone else to, to translate, but not to translate for our employers, to translate our theoretical and developed approach to what what is to be done and and that's what not I mean not that there's anything wrong with translating for employees but that's the the issue should be much broader and nowadays we call it critical anthropology engaged anthropology and public anthropology and I think if we want to call it applied fine <laughs> <laughs> Irve, your your idea about what has to happen next is well, there would have been five minutes, so I think we are more or less on time. We had about four, five more minutes if anybody wants to pick up on Questions? I really like the idea of engaged anthropology because when you try and think of well, what would be the flip side of that? That would make you want to crawl under a rock. Oh, that's right. right. I'm disengaged <laughs> as an anthropologist. <laughs> yeah. Nice contrast. Yeah. yeah. That's good. It goes with the divorce between theory and practice as well. Yeah. I thought that was a good joke. I mean, you know, one of the other things that comes through too is that it, for, uh, I mean, I didn't speak of, you know, my mentor per se, but Nancy Shepard Hughes has been a really influential mm -hmm. presence in, in my in life and in my training, right? And she's someone who, who moved from really sort of uh, pragmatic to to critical to activist to um, really something even beyond that you know really sort of rebellious um, and and I think my point is that everybody who's sitting here the the main message here is that whoever it is who mentors you is the one who really um, looms large in terms of the way you think even in a philosophical way, not just a, a, the pragmatics or practice or whatever, but these really inspiring figures. And it's interesting, you know, with Joan, so when Joan retired, I, I took her place. Yeah, I replaced Joan and it was, and everyone always said that, oh, you're Joan's replacement, which was really <laughs> a terrifying thought. <laughs> that, you know, I was trained initially as an Africanist, and I knew who she was, and to think that you could ever even, I mean, I even got to the point where like, I felt I needed to get a different office chair. <laughs> I just, I couldn't, I couldn't sit in her office because she was just such a gigantic presence. But more importantly, the Manchester School is really uh, just an inescapable um, part of our, you know, our shared histories in that way, that it, it was a, a, a very engaged, critical, um, and daring, I think, um, school of thought and practice in anthropology that gets poo-pooed by a lot of people, a lot of our contemporaries who think that, well, that's old school and it was colonialist. Mm -hmm. And but if you, if you 
delve into that literature, you real, realize very quickly that that's a false um, representation. And you and even um, I mean Elizabeth Coulson was has always been very important for me. She was one of the first professors I had in graduate school. She's long retired, um, and I still hear from her, and she's almost 100 years old at this point. But she took over from Gluckman when Gluckman wasn't running um, you know, the Rose Livingston Institute in, in, in Central Africa. So there, I think a lot of it has to do with our pedigrees. I guess that's the best way to well, put you know, it. What so. I think, Colson in her 90s was still sitting on boards and making decisions about children in America. She is a phenomenal woman. Mm -hmm. But I also think that you choose your, I had many, there were many people, there were probably 50 anthropologists on, and you sort of find the people that, I think people in the audience, those of you that are doctoral students or whatever, people, you know, you go look for what represents I'm sure you sort out Elizabeth Colson and Nancy Jeffrey Hughes and whatever. So, so I think that it's also about what you're in the field for, what 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 it is that you see that it's not for money, like like we all said. <laughs> I mean, talking about ancestors, I mean, I was in Chicago and I never noticed that it was not Colombian, except that we did at one point had a ritual burning of one of Harris's books. <laughs> <laughs> Soul tax, and we were all told That's right. uh, uh, not to talk to soul tax. That little man that was running around in a exactly. big, big set of offices with that had nothing to do with it. And he was the most mm -hmm. applied, right? We should he have was the actual anthropologist fighting yes. Harrisburg, so that's I discovered that I recently. And we'll, but the interesting thing is that I was put in a different silo. I, I was a French anthropologist that was going to study the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very much, like Milton Singer was there, right. I was pushed to be, play the, the foreigner back on the natives, etc. to play at yeah. And I, it was a very comfortable silo, so I was very happy, but it did put me in a silo of the outsider. <laughs> and then the, the other question about talking anthropology to your employers. I never did any consulting in my life, but I thought that for the first 15 years of my life, I taught nurses and social workers yeah. uh, in the Department of Home and Family Life, Labor, Family and Community Relations, not in anthropology. And it's, this is part of my hesitation. You have a social worker with uh, 20 years of experience as a social worker, or a nurse, neonatal nurse, 20 years of experience in neonatal nurse, and as at that point, 25-year-old in the University of Chicago, I did not feel I really could tell 40-year-old professional woman how to do nursing better. I never been, as a, you can see. So I, I remained in that double silo of being relatively theoretical anthropologist of my training, and also most of my experiences teaching has been really through all my formative years and until recently, very much with non-anthropologists. And part of becoming chair of the Department of International and Transcultural Studies was also at the time I was there, being chair of a department that's mostly not about anthropologists, but include a lot of students who are interested in what anthropologists have to do. So, so it's but, but always I feel when some of our students come now and doing work in AD and et cetera, I personally don't know what to do <laughs> in a more detailed fashion, the, the larger politics. So, so, yes, I mean, I should uh, talk a little bit more about the, the ethical dilemma I, was, I raised because it, it happens in anthropology and education just as well. Uh, when we had the evaluation contract to evaluate the mayor's dropout prevention initiative, I began to think, you know, that these kids are making a pretty rational decision given the circumstance and given the fact that their school hadn't been painted in 40 years and the plaster was falling down and, and et cetera. And a lot, a lot of things were communicating to these kids that they were worthless. And, and to keep them in that system in the name of preventing dropouts was questionable. Um, and it's also applicable to the label that gets used. The value system gets in the label. But the phrase dropout, you know, as if people just dropped through the floor, it, they didn't make any decision to do it, as opposed to what the English have always called school leavers, uh, which emphasizes that it's a rational choice that somebody's making. 
Um, and and that there is an agency to the latter to the latter label that doesn't appear in the first. And and since one of the things I believe in is human agency, that's that's not a good thing. You had a question, but I think. I think that one of my responses is that we won that battle already. And if you look at the jobs that are opening mm -hmm. up for applied anthropologists, you'll find them in regular anthropology departments yes. more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they feel the need to have at least one, you know, that's our applied anthropology. It's like the Columbia attitude towards psychological anthropology. When I was hired, Mort Freak took me to lunch and said, I hope you come because we won't have to replace Margaret when she retires. <laughs> Uh, and I was 24 at the time, and the thought of replacing, replacing Margaret, Margaret and me uh, was <laughs> intimidating. I, I, uh, no, I, I think we have won that battle. I think if you look at the larger field of anthropology today, if you look, the way we haven't won it is if you look at the very, you know, the Ivy League, a few of them, and stuff like that. But if you look at most of the state universities, the number of places where there are jobs in anthropology, and the ways in which anthropology is, even if you look at the journals, cultural anthropology, American ethnologists, they're really shifting yeah. in lots of ways. You don't yeah. see that glorification of, of the abstract in the way that you would have 10 years ago. So I think it's, it's shifting back, in a way, into a much more recognition of the need for the quotes nitty gritty within a lot, and that it's theoretical too. I mean, there's always. Can I throw, just throw in one more thing, which is, I mean, I'm based at Barnard, so I spend the majority of my time with undergraduates. And, and for me, I see teaching as a grassroots, as a form of grassroots activism. Mm -hmm. That I'm not ju just there to teach them the history of anthropology, although that is part of my job. I teach the, the history class. Um, and I'm not there just to teach them, this is the canon that you should know. Instead, I think that my job every single day is to shake them up. And because I'm a medical anthropologist, I get a lot of pre-meds. And the pre-meds take anthropology for strategic reasons. They major in the discipline because they think that's going to, I'm going to have a great interview when it's time for me to be interviewed by medical schools because I can show that I, I'm a humanist. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I tell them, you know, sort of ha only half jokingly, is they say, take my class so I can talk you out of being a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I actually just said that to a student yesterday, and she looked like a deer caught in the headlights. I've always known I wanted to be a doctor. My parents expect me to be a doctor. I'm like, right, take my class. Take my class. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, part of, if nothing else, part of our job in the classroom is to alter their course somehow. Not because she shouldn't be a doctor, but that she needs to be thinking really carefully about why she's making that decision. And if you're going to major in anthropology, then make it work in such a way that it's transformative as an experience, not something that looks good on your resume. And I think we're great at that form of entrapment. <laughs> you know, and, and whatever you want to call it, what kind of anthropology that is, I don't know. But that's essential to what we do. And at the undergraduate level in particular, that's when you've got to grab them, you know, before they professionalize. 